I want to thank our sponsor, Aviate Watches, who are releasing their Dan Buster Chadwick Mecha Quartz timepiece, which pays tribute to Roy Chadwick, the visionary aircraft designer for the Avro company, whose crucial contributions played a pivotal role in the success of the Dan Buster raid during World War II. The watch has amazing detail, with one of my favourite parts being the 617 Dan Buster logo as a counterbalance on the second sand. They come in three stunning colours which you can find via avi-8.com or head to the description below for more details and links. Thank you and enjoy. So like where Tycoon is now with um, the RAF and other European nations, is this where you expected it should be or do you think it should have come sooner? Or? Everybody wants it sooner. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> wants it sooner. But what a lot of people don't realise is just how comprehensive the f testing has to be to make sure things are, are uh, safe, airworthy, reliable, um, approved. There's so many regulators in the, in the chain. There's a, a huge amount of work. Yes, you could probably, in a, in, in, in a crisis, in war, you could bolt another weapon on and go off and do it. it and, yeah. and do it. And you get uh, what are called emergency operational clearances. A lot of them happen in the Gulf War onto a tornado. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, that looks about right. That will that will do. It's fine, but to get the proper safe for little Johnny, new test pilot to fly, so his mummy doesn't get upset when he <laughs> crashes, <laughs> and the lawyers don't get involved. There's a lot of work to dot every I and cross every T. Yeah, absolutely. I should have probably asked this earlier, but uh, all the maintainers, engineers, were they all uh, ex-military, or did they come from a separate company? Um, I can't talk for the other nations, but it, at, at Wharton and BA Systems, a lot of them were um, through and through company trained apprentices in there. And they're people who are, who've spent their lifetime working on prototype aeroplanes. Mm. Um, we had a number of Air Force guys in getting you know, first insight into what the aeroplane was bringing with it. Because you can't just say, right, we've finished testing, over to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll get the book out and start from... No, there was, there was guys embedded um, in, in all areas, all the different systems and all the different jobs, so that when the Air Force started taking delivery, it had a, a core of people that kind of knew what they were doing. Yeah. And would you, on a social side, would you all mix? And like when you were out mixing, was it all typhoon chat or could you switch off? Uh, no, we, we did. We, and, and we, we did socialise a fair amount. Um, a lot of, with the four nations, yeah. uh, we, we, we do, each nation would take its turn to host what was called the cockpit committee or cockpit group meeting. Nice. Uh, and so we'd all tra trips off to Madrid or to uh, Munich or to Turin or to Blackpool. There were always two or three day meetings so that you'd have time to socialise and you know, it wasn't a case of trying to outdo each other's hospitality, but you know, we look after the group. Um, yeah, pilots will be pilots and they'll talk about their job. Yeah, absolutely. For you guys at home, uh, Craig uh, messaged me yesterday um, and mentioned a few incidents. I know there's a few there, so maybe can you go through a few of them because they can sound we, fascinating. Can we, can we change the word to events rather events. than okay. incidents? Yeah, incidents, right. Uh, incidents makes it sound like it was a, a, an accident, <laughs> <laughs> well, a, an accident in brewing. Right. There's lots of, of memorable things that, that happened. Um, Let's start with when we were testing DA2 uh, to make sure that the carefree handling bit worked, we obviously had to go to the, the very edges of the, the envelope. And in doing so, just in case, you may, we, we had a bolted onto the back end of the airplane, it was like a tripod yeah, yeah. With, a, with a parachute, and that was called the spin recovery system. If the airplane were to lose control, one of the actions was to, you know, hit the switch to pull the, the spin recovery sheet. And we did, we did this in the simulator time and again. We made all sorts, all sorts of contingencies of what could go wrong so that the test team on the ground, the pilot in the cockpit, and it, for these sorts of tests, we also had another safety pilot alongside on the ground. We're all looking at parameters. We knew what we were gonna do if, if certain things were gonna happen. Mm -hmm. But the spin sheet was there as a, um, as a backup in case it would never used in anger in the earth probe, never, never even close to it. We had to test that it worked before, and we'd done that. And, and as we were approaching so my first flight to, to um, explore the edges of the envelope in the thing as an Air Force pilot, um, we'd gone into the simulator, and, and one of the predictions was that the airplane could get into a really flat spin. 
a high rate of rotation, centrifugal forces, think Top Gun, Maverick, all the rest of it, yeah. um, it might make it difficult to, to reach the switches. So the spin recovery sh switch itself, had a, with a, not, not a bottom-down switch, but it had a cover guard over it. You didn't want to knock it in action. So we decided that part of our checks before going into the manoeuvre, we'd, we'd raise the cover guard so that it was one less thing to do if we needed it in a bad situation. Fine, did it in lots of time, off we went to flight, climbing up through about 30,000 feet and right, go through the actions of what to do, uh, do this, do that, raise the cover guard. Raise the cover guard, hit the switch. Yeah. Boom, shoot came out and disappeared off, going far too quickly. And there's a quiet voice on the ground saying, what did you just do? <laughs> I go, oh. Because <laughs> every cover guarded switch in every other airplane anybody has ever flown, you don't raise the cover guard and do nothing. You raise the cover guard to get to the yeah. switch. Yeah, yeah. So human error, human nature says, raise the cover guard, hit the switch. Which is exactly what I did. Shoot pops out, drops off into the middle of the REC. Without the shoot, there's no testing I can do at that point because we don't have the backup. So I've got, mm, I've got five tons of fuel to use. Um, mm, sorry, boys. <laughs> yeah, sheep be here. So that was embarrassing. So the words, what did you just do? Yeah. Will, will echo with me. It sticks in your mind. Yeah, go, oh, idiot. <laughs> um, other one, there's a, there's a, a, a picture out there, of, of the, a lovely picture of me pushing a TriStar along at sunset. The irony of that picture is I've just got five tonnes of fuel on board <laughs> as the sun's going down in an airplane that at that time didn't have a clearance to fly in the dark. Nice. Uh, oh dear, right, so that was five minutes of full power to burn off the fuel to come back and land quickly. Um, Displaying at Farnborough was awesome. Yeah, what was that like? Tell me about that. And did you, go, did you uh, put your name in, or were they just like, Craig, you go for it? Um, why did it come? No, they, 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 there's really only one project, Leeds project pilot with each of the companies. Okay, got you. And at the time, the, 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 the display was always done by a company test pilot, not a, not a customer test yeah. pilot. So I, I joined the company by then, uh, and Germany, I said, the Berlin Air Show and the Farmer Air Show, we, uh, we kind of took it in turns to share the displays between the, my German counterpart and myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and it came time and I was, I was there, it was my turn, have a go. Uh, so there's a, a well-documented, well-regulated workup sequence. You start mm -hmm. at the base height of 3,000 feet and work down in steps till you, till you got down to 500 feet or 200 feet for manoeuvres. And then you've got to have your display authorised and approved. Oh, yeah, of course. And then you've got to go to Farnborough and they authorise it and display it before you do it in front of the public. You know, there's tragically lots of lessons learned from the past that, yeah. that are the reasons why these things are so well um, controlled. But, you know, sitting on the end of the runway at Farnborough, where as a kid from school watching uh, Raymond Baxter talking about harriers and ski jumps and all sorts of iconic things in history have happened at Farnborough. Here you are sat in the latest and greatest thing about to take off and display. Uh, not without its uh, incident on one occasion. We, you know, we fly with smoke winders, the, the sidewinder bodies with uh, diesel fuel and dye in there to make smoke trails in the sky. Uh, and it was fudged. You had to, I can't remember what you had to do, but there was a, a, we'd fudge one of the buttons on the stick that was the, the ignition for the smoke winders. Yep. But it was stupidly, it would light one, light the other, and then keep both going, so you had the three times to press the button. And it took a few seconds for it to start and stop. Uh, so at the end of the display, I was hit the button to make them all stop, but I'd started the sequence off again, so I was landed with one of these smoke winders still burning, and they need the air to go through to keep them cool. Yeah. You know, oh, what have you done? Again, what have you done now? <laughs> Sorry. Um, we also displayed in Austria, is that right? Well, I said that was that was one of the the, the sad thing. The, uh, for some reason, the German test pilot wasn't able to do this display. It was a, a tiny little grass airfield stuck at the bottom of a valley, and they said, "Craig, can you come and do your typhoon display there?" So I went across, and because of the location, I had to go and fly with the Austrian Air Force in one of their Saab 105 things yeah. just to see that it's like. Ooh, this, this would be interesting because there's, there's uh, steep-sided valleys and it, it was yeah, big yeah. enough but it's 
it's a subliminal thing. So we did that, and um, uh, right, yeah, we can do this. But on the day in question, the bloody aeroplane wouldn't start. Yeah. We, wouldn't, they, we tried everything to make it start restarting. I never got to, to do that display, so that was a bit of a bit of a bummer. Um, being shot at is another that's pretty memorable. Oh, okay. <laughs> start the, the um, in fact, it was all, the briefing for it actually took place on April the 1st. So we go into the briefing room and this is a set of testing we're going to do to test the missile approach warner. Missile approach warner is three little radars scattered around the aeroplane that do what they say in the tin. They'll, they'll warn you if a missile, a fast moving projectile, is approaching. Mm -hmm. Obviously you've got to test this. So it's a bit terminal if you test it with real missiles. So how are we going to test this then? Oh. Well, what we'll do is we'll put a chieftain tank on the ground and it'll point his barrel up and you'll fly a parallel path, slightly displaced to one side, and at the appropriate time and space, the chieftain will fire his, his gun and the, the shell will go whistling past. No problem, job done. The system will, 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 will detect or will not detect. It. Hmm. The bit that worried me was the tank commander, not known for their intellect, tank commanders, said, um, yeah, before you need to give us about five minutes warning before we're going to do the first one because we want to warm up the barrel because a cold gun barrel is less accurate than a warm gun barrel. Mm -hmm. I said, you can fire as many shells as you want, make sure that bugger's warm because I don't want inaccurate shells whistling past. Yeah. So we, we did that and um, the first trials we did were flying the, pointing the same way as the shell. So flew over the tank and then out in front of him and he, he fired past me. You he, he could feel the shock wave oh, of the really? shell passing. Oh. It was, I think, I think we, it was meant to be 100 meters off the, the wingtip. Still pretty close in my book. Yeah. Um, and then later on, we did it on pointing towards him. So you could come out, it was all done off the Welsh coast in Aberporth. And you could, you could see the tank on the ground and you see the puff of smoke come up and go, course it's perfectly safe and but and the system worked as advertised I didn't know if it was working so there was nothing in the cockpit to tell me it was working it was all done in data recording back yeah. on the ground but I've been shot at a lot <laughs> that sounds great um, tell us about the visual inspection of the air uh, oh another embarrassing one <laughs> yeah um, Minister for Defence Procurement or somebody who was paying the bills came for a flight in the two-seat DA4 mm -hmm. and my colleague John Turner was the chief typhoon pilot at the time so he took him off and it was very early days and at that time after the airplane had flown supersonically um, it had to have a visual inspection done before um, putting the gear down and stuff it, it, it just belt and brace and make sure nothing's happened so I was assigned to do the visual inspection that and went around, flew underneath him um, and if you, ever, if you ever look at the picture of the underside of a typhoon at the, at the nose undercarriage bay you can see where the, the doors are and there's a little d-shaped door thing or d-shaped space at the back mm -hmm. it was a space i thought oh shit, it's fallen off uh, so i reported that you know, the other the d door had fallen off and then we very carefully didn't do any more flying after that he just came back and landed and then an hour or so later, one of the flight test guys came in with a picture. He said, Craig, is this the bit that you saw that was missing? Yeah, there isn't a bit there. It's a hole. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Again. Sorry is a famous word. Yeah, apparently so. This one interests me. Uh, Ouija board uh, training. Oh, Ouija board. The Ouija board goes back to... Um, the spin recovery system and preparing for carefree handling you know, eventualities. You know, there's in the tele telemetry room we've talked about. You've got all these traces running, little you know heart monitor wires. When the airplane's doing things with its speed, its angle of attack, its angle of yaw, uh, all the different parameters are there. And in order to train the team to react. The, the simplest way they came up with was create this Ouija board. It's a tall table. You need four people or five people around it, I think. And they all had little twiddly knobs that drove the pens on the traces. Right. So that they'd be a little hustle, right? It's going to do a practice maneuver and then link to the simulator. Um, and they said, we'll, we'll do a, a class three departure. 
and, and they all knew which way they had to so that, that drove the traces that the safety pilot and the boffin were looking at mm. but they were all it was all done manually it was nothing nothing clever software wise it was, it was they, you used that for the tornado and they used it for typhoon and i dare say they'll use something similar in in the future but um getting it all coordinated so that you're in phase so the traces look like it was quite, it was quite very clever another point here you met uh, you text me uh, when is a clock not a clock when is a clock not a clock <laughs> yes um job was to go and fly over horse guards parade with da2 um queen's birthday thing there was a number of other airplanes so it was a you, know, you, you have to be there time on target yeah. Uh, it was in the evening about seven o'clock. Time on targets, one of the things, you go, oh, can't really screw this up because the Queen's there for a start. And you take off and walk and fly down to Colchester and then you run in past the dome and all that stuff. Everything's working to time. So I've got, got my watch on. I've got a lovely digital stopwatch in the, in, in the airplane that start off. You know what time, you, so you know everything that's got to be. I had, I, had, I had two watches on, I think. Start, so I know where all the times have to be where. And then halfway down to Colchester, I go, in, these, these don't tie up anymore. I don't know, the time, some time has disappeared. I don't know what's going on. And it transpired that the aircraft stopwatch is wrong. Right. Was wrong. It was, again, early days, because it was based on the frequency of the, of the avionics system. It wasn't counting exactly in seconds. It was counting in 50 sixtieths of a second. So over the 45 minutes, we end up with a few minutes of drift. So I revert to number one aircrew watch and got over the Queen on time. Brilliant stuff. Is there one memory that really sticks out for you, uh, you uh, flying and testing the Typhoon? I mean, you mentioned a few there, but is there one that just never goes away? I think it has to be the first first flight. Mm. You know, in a single seat airplane in a foreign country, in an airplane that's got 14 hours on the clock, Going, oh, don't screw up. Don't screw, yeah, that that responsibility, that thrill. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And could you feel uh, the takeoff difference? Yeah, like let's say the lightning. Would it like the burns kick in faster than the lightning, or was it similar? Or? It was way way fast. The, the the reheat ignition in Typhoon certainly that early standard of EJ was almost instant. Never seen anything like that before. We could. We could with um, the F-15, for example, it's got five stages. You can, you can feel each of the five stages. Oh, go, really? Yeah, slightly. Um, but EJ-200s were instant, lots of power, lots of work straight away. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of questions here from our patrons, if you're happy to answer them. Sure. Quick. So this is from Joe Kunzler. How do you think the Eurofighter performs against the F uh, F-16C, say, Block 40 or 50? Uh, um, extremely well. Remembering, of course, at the end of the day, it's the driver that's going to win or lose. You can give the driver the best tools in the world and he can still screw it up. Mm. So, uh, single engine F-16, uh, thrust to weight ratios, if you start, compare it pure mechanically in terms of thrust to weight ratio and lift, uh, lift to drag ratios and all the rest of it, Typhoon's demonstrably more capable mm -hmm. in that regime. In terms of carrying number of weapons, can do more than that. In, term, in terms of uh, what you're getting to see in the cockpit, data fusion, better radar, better sensors, it's, everybody's, everybody's going for the same aims. Yeah. It's, it's how well you present them to the pilot at the end of the day that makes a difference. So, a, a very capable airplane. I know which one I'd rather have. <laughs> So this is from Golf 77. Which cockpit was the best that like, you flew in? I'm guessing you mean it's ergonomics. Uh, uh, ergonomics. The, the F-15 is a huge cockpit, lots of space to stretch out. Lightning, shoehorn yourself in there. Um, Typhoon, nicely moderate, not too big, well laid out. And an exceptional amount of effort went into the design process to make sure that the cockpit was not an ergonomic slum. And, and that things were where they should be in the right sort of priorities, distinguishable, reachable, um, viewable, if that's a word. Um, so, yeah, Typhoon, excellent. This is from John. If you were in a drag race um, with an F-15 over 10 miles, who would win? 
depends on the altitude again. Depends, yeah, it depends on the altitude. Of, which which fifteen for C or an E or, or an E X? <laughs> um, which engines the F fifteen got? It's got the two two nines. Um, I'm pretty sure Typhoon will win. I, I, I need to look at some of the data from more recent engine performances, but yeah, F fifteen is a big airplane, square front, yeah, bit of drag. And this is from Bill 50. If you could jump in the cockpit of any fight that you've flown for one last trip, which would you go for? Lightning. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was fortunate I got to fly Lightnings after they'd left service. The, the Mike Beachy head in South Africa picked them up and was flying them. So I went and air tested that and then taught him to fly. Mm -hmm. Sent him solo, in fact. Uh, and it's quite strange coming back to the Lightning after flying all the different airplanes in testing, mm -hmm. my, my fingers and my hands knew where to go without having to think about it. Yeah. It was just you know, familiarity and the yeah. smell and all the rest of it. So yeah, I think that if it were possible, but it's not at the moment. So <laughs> it's not good. Stuff. And this one's from Anonymous. Um, would you enjoy meeting up with your ex F-15 friends and talking about Typhoon? <laughs> I do. Oh, you do? <laughs> I do. Um, yeah, variously. The, um, a lot of my F-15 friends are Americans. There's a couple of Brits along with other who did exchange some of the time. We do talk about it. Um, yeah, fighter pilots will talk about their airplane. It's a, it's a chosen child, favourite child. Um, there must be a lot of banter as well back in the There is. The, 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 there's, some, there's some people are better at banter than others. Um, <laughs> my Canadian friend Billy Flynn, if you're watching, he's pretty good at banter. And do, uh, I mean, yes, like the talking about the banter thing there, does anyone get offended or is it just indifferent no. to you? Like, there's no, like, oh, how dare you? Oh, you've got to expect it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, uh, and part of my job was to go uh, and talk at um, seminars and presentations and marketing bits and pieces, you know, selling the virtues of, of Typhoon and, you know, where possible, dissing the, op the opposition. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, um, marketing and, and what's out there in the press and what certain companies want to say about their airplanes. Yeah. You just, well, well, let, let's show you the real data. And there, there's lots of um, operational analysis tools out there that you can plug uh, all your parameters into a simulator and repeat. Because if you put real pilots in there, they'll change, they'll do something different. Yeah. But if you want to actually quantitatively and academically study the difference between two, you've got to do thousands of runs to, to eliminate the, the randomness uh, and see who wins and who loses. So data like that is endorsed by the government, so it's irrefutable. That, yeah. you know, we put our model of Typhoon against your model of whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, data in is data in, yeah. rubbish in, rubbish out yeah. type of thing. <laughs> but based on the best data available, this is this is the result we get. But it's still the pilot driving it at the end Absolutely, of the day. And yeah. if he messes up, yeah. you lose. And did you enjoy the kind of, uh, you know, selling the aircraft and meeting the public, as it were? Maybe, did you meet the public? Probably oh, farmers. Oh, yeah, lots lots of public, and that's always... What was that it, like? Well, it's, it's, it's what always struck me was um, how variable they could be. Uh, we, we had a, a cockpit simulator, big wraparound visual system, exactly like the air, airplane, flew really well. And you plonk people in there who... who know very little about flying and you get the 12-year-old kid who could ace it take off land and all the rest of it and then you, wow. okay. you get the guy who's there with a stick and the, the world's turning upside down and he's got no concept of what's going he's looking at something here yeah. as he plows into the ground but yeah that that, that bit always uh, amused me but, but seven days at Farnborough talking non-stop th through the same stuff uh, yes it's got three dirt TVs it can do this that's the stick that's the throttle it this you go, oh. And you must be media trained to go in front of the cameras. Or, yeah. yeah, one of the best investments the company put in was how to do the, uh, the media training bit, how to parry off the Paxman interview. Or yes, I, I never, I, <laughs> only on one one or two occasions did I have a, have any sort of challenging interviews that were trying to make a point. A lot of it was information gathering. They were on side. But one or two times, you know, they were saying, well, this is rubbish, it's a, it's a Cold War airplane, why is, why does it cost this much? That sort of... It's like almost clickbait at the time, like Eurofighter Typhoon test pilot says this, and you're like... Well, that's, another, that's a good one, that one. On, um, after 
I'd flown DA7 for the, the first time, uh, I, d I gave a news, a, a magazine interview to the MOD's in-house magazine. Right. So all the people who were involved in the program got the latest update that where Craig flew this. And, and in that I said, yeah, there's a few little handling problems, but they're all well known and the fixes are in the pipeline. And then one Sunday I was at home and had the Sunday Telegraph opened oh, no. up. And, and page five in there was Eurofighter has handling problems, test pilot admits, exclamation mark. Squadron leader Craig Penrice said, blah, blah, in the in those magazine. And, and afterwards it said what I said, you know, there's problems there. But the headline is, yeah. so chief of staff is on the phone to, to dear Craig at home on a Sunday saying, oh, what on earth What's are you doing? <laughs> so if you, well, well, this is what happened. Uh, but yeah. press uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. life into themselves. And one last question for me, um, did, you, did you ever go to air shows, not even in, with Typhoon, but uh, Lightning and do the static, and did you enjoy like interacting with the bubbly? We I loved about? it. Yeah. I lo yeah. Even the F-15, did you do that as? Um, did I get to do it with the F-15? Mm, no, I don't, think I, I don't think I did with the F-15. Um, but but the Lightning, the Hunter, Hawk a lot with the Hawk. Um, yeah, that it, must it's, have been fun. it was good, good banter. Yeah, I've heard that um, Airshow hangar parties are really, really well. Best party in the world was um, the, uh, the, uh, Riyadh Fairford when it was, the, I think, the 25th anniversary of the Red Arrows. Right. And everybody, you know, blistering hot four days in, standing in there. Then on the Sunday night, they bust all 400 air crew down to uh, South Cerny Airfield for a hangar party that was awesome. <laughs> awesome stuff. So, uh, one last question, sorry. Um, how many hours did you get uh, flying and uh, testing Typhoon? Uh, I think it's about it's just over 300. Not bad. Not, not, very, not very many. And as you're aware, my time came to a, a premature end. Um, but I, I ticked all the boxes, I've done lots of things. So, yeah. Sounds like you had a great time. 300 at, at that point in the, in the program is quite a big yeah. percentage of it. So, yeah, no, I was very lucky. Yeah.